hello and welcome to week five of our review of Zonzakin Rinpoche's teachings on Samantabhadra's King of Aspiration Prayers, the Pranidhana Raja. In this week's image, we see a solitary figure of a practitioner walking on a path through difficult and unforgiving terrain. There's a mountain ahead, majestic yet daunting, which represents their ultimate aim, perhaps enlightenment itself. The journey is not for the faint of heart. It is a path fraught with obstacles, yet it is the very challenge of the climb that strengthens our spirit. How many times have we found ourselves on a similar path in our lives, where the goal seems distant and the road arduous? As we begin week five, let us reflect on this image. What does the mountain ahead symbolize for you in your practice? How does the figure's steady progress, step by step, resonate with your own journey? And most importantly, when the path becomes steep and the footing uncertain, what is it that propels us forward? We're going to explore the deep reserves of perseverance that lie within us and discover how to harness them, just as the practitioner in this image does, with unwavering focus on the path ahead. So as usual, let's just take a moment to tune our motivation for this week, reminding ourselves that we wish to approach this with bodhicitta, the aspiration that we might attain enlightenment for the sake of enlightening all beings. So the title for week five is Perseverance, and the verses this week cover two, perhaps two and a half key themes. First, handling challenges and setbacks on the path. We know that difficulties, setbacks and disappointments are an inevitable path of the Bodhisattva path. Indeed, of any path where we're trying to accomplish something meaningful and worthwhile. So how can the Bodhisattva find a way to handle these challenges without getting discouraged and losing inspiration? Secondly, relating to others on the path. We already started last week to explore the idea of how to be a spiritual friend, including Rinpoche's lovely example of the YouTube Bodhisattva. This week's verses will go into this topic in more depth. How should the Bodhisattva relate to others on the path, especially when they might appear to us to be the sources of some of the difficulties and challenges that we face? And finally, purifying our perception. This is a topic that's going to become more important in future weeks, but already this week we are coming to verses that talk about seeing Buddhas and receiving teachings at all times. So how might we start to refine and purify our perception? We're going to introduce this theme this week, but not go too deeply, which is why I'm saying perhaps two and a half themes. So in terms of the structure of the verses this week, Let's just review where we're at in the text. After an introduction in week one and discussion of the benefits of reciting this prayer in week two, we went through the initial practices of the seven branch offering in week three and started the actual aspiration last week in week four. Last week, we looked at how the practitioner progresses along the Mahayana journey when we talked about the five paths. And we started the verses of the Pranidhana Raja that are focused on what Rinpoche called the beginner bodhisattvas of the first and second of these five paths. We're going to conclude those verses today and to help us understand the progression on the bodhisattva's journey that is covered in today's verses, let's talk about the first and second paths in a little more detail. So the first path, the path of accumulation, is about effortless motivation. We saw last week the first path begins when we wholeheartedly commit to the Mahayana path. We talked about crossing the threshold and taking the Bodhisattva vow, and we also acknowledge that there's quite likely going to be a deepening in the sincerity and authenticity of our Bodhisattva vow after we've taken the vow a hundred thousand times, for example, in our Nindra practice. In any case, the Mahayana teachings say we attain the first path which is also translated as the first pathway mind, when we have attained unlabored bodhicitta as our primary motivation in life. 
So unlabored means that this mental factor arises without us needing to work ourselves up to it by relying step by step on a line of reasoning. In other words, it's become part of us. We no longer need to convince ourselves this is the right thing to do. Now, more fully in the Theravada path, we attain the first path when we attain unlabored renunciation as our primary motivation in life. And in the Mahayana, we attain the first path when we attain unlabored renunciation and also unlabored bodhicitta. So we don't actually attain the first path if we haven't got this unlabored renunciation as well. We haven't spent much time talking about renunciation so far. And I know this can sometimes feel like a bit of a touchy topic for contemporary Buddhists, as many of us want to have our cake and eat it too. Yes, we would like all the inspiration and benefits of being practitioners of the Mahayana, but we also value our material comforts and personal fulfillment of our ordinary lives. And for many of us, this creates an unresolved tension at the heart of our spiritual path. So we'll talk about this more in the later weeks. But going back to the meaning of unlabored bodhicitta as our primary motivation in life, this doesn't necessarily mean that we are conscious or attentive of this motivation in every moment from that point onwards. Nor does it mean that we don't have other short-term motivations, such as the motivation to go to the store and buy groceries. Nevertheless, even when we're not consciously thinking about renunciation or bodhicitta, we still have the intention to achieve liberation and enlightenment and to benefit all sentient beings. We never lose that intention as our primary motivation in our lives, no matter what we do. So to repeat, the first path is defined by our primary motivation and aspiration, which is why for beginners like us, aspiration is considered the most important practice because genuine and unlabored renunciation and bodhicitta are above all about transforming our motivation and aspiration from ordinary worldly aspirations to the grand Mahayana aspiration of bodhicitta. And after we have reoriented our primary motivation, the rest of our path, right until enlightenment, is about cultivating wisdom through hearing, contemplation and meditation. As Ons Kenzerimche often says, the Buddhist path is above all a path of wisdom. He also talks about it in terms of realizing the truth. So let's take a moment to understand what do we mean when we say realizing the truth? In both the Theravada and Mahayana paths, the main meditation object for Shravakas, Pratyeka Buddhas and Bodhisattvas throughout all of the five paths are what is known as the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths. Now, this is a large and somewhat technical topic, especially because anatta, or non-self, is defined somewhat differently in the Theravada and Mahayana traditions. However, let, let's take the risk of oversimplification and say that during the five paths, what we're doing is cultivating discriminating awareness and removing defilements and wrong views. In other words, we're cultivating wisdom by meditating on the truth, the true nature of self and phenomena. And in the Mahayana, this means meditating on emptiness or shunyata, which we can also talk about in terms of meditating on non-dual wisdom or even meditating on the nature of mind. Now, of course, before we can meditate on the truth, we need to learn a little bit about what it is that we're supposed to be meditating on. So we will need to spend some time hearing and contemplating the teachings to better understand this truth, much of which will happen in parallel with our journey to cultivate a stronger and more genuine aspiration. And ideally, the two will support each other. As we learn more, we'll become more inspired about cultivating genuine aspiration to follow the path. And as our aspiration matures, we'll become more inspired to deepen our understanding. So back to the five paths, as we proceed on the first path, we achieve what's known as shamatha, focused on this truth or nature. In other words, we're able to maintain a serenely stilled and settled state of mind, calm abiding, 
focused on the truth of emptiness of self and of all phenomena. Now we transition to the second path, which is the path of joining or the path of preparation, when we attain an effortless understanding of the view. So this is about achieving not just shamatha, but both shamatha and vipassana focused conceptually on the truth. In other words, the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths. And thus we gain what is known as the wisdom that arises from meditation. In other words, we have both intellectual and meditative understanding of emptiness, although we don't yet have direct realization, which only comes on the third path, the path of seeing. And in the same way that on the first path we have attained unlabored bodhicitta as our primary motivation, on the second path we attain unlabored certitude or conviction in our conceptual understanding of emptiness. We firmly establish the view of emptiness or non-duality, and it is now the primary way that we see the world. Now this may not sound especially significant, but according to the Mahayana teachings, it means we will no longer be reborn in any of the three lower realms, hell, hungry ghost, or animal realms. In other words, we'll no longer be in the grip of strong negative emotions, especially anger. It's also worth noting that mindfulness alone is not the mark of progress on the Mahayana path, because even before the first path, we may already have achieved shamatha and vipassana focused on some other object, in other words, something other than the truth of emptiness. And in fact, this attainment is not exclusively Buddhist. Non-Buddhist meditators also practice and achieve shamatha and vipassana, although not focused on the truth as identified in Buddhism. In other words, the emptiness of self and phenomena. And so this is why so much time is spent in Buddhist philosophy establishing the truth and debating emptiness. We want to make sure that we have the correct object for our meditation, the right view that we're trying to understand and realize, because otherwise we're not even practicing according to the Buddhist path. Also last week we mentioned that Rinpoche talk, likes to talk about enlightenment in terms of realizing the truth. And we can now see that this is literally what the Mahayana teachings are saying. Right? Since the truth of emptiness, or more fully the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths, is our meditation object throughout the path until we attain enlightenment. From our early, more conceptual and dualistic practice of mindfulness and meditation, and remaining so, as our practice progressively becomes more non-conceptual and non-dual. And then the third path, the path of seeing, is realization of the view. That's when we achieve both shamatha and vipassana focused non-conceptually on the truth. In other words, when we have a direct non-dual realization of this truth. This is also known as yogic bare cognition. And we're going to come to these verses next week, in week six. So, in terms of the actual aspiration in the Pranidhana Raja, we said there are 16 aspirations, and the first 10 of these are those on the first and second of these five parts. So let's review the progression. Last week in week four, we covered the first four of these aspirations which are about aspiring to aspire well. We aspire to be able to authentically take refuge in the Bodhisattva vow, during which time we're also engaging in hearing and contemplation to develop an intellectual understanding of emptiness. We're also cultivating merit, so the aspiration of bodhicitta slowly but surely becomes our primary motivation in life. Now this week we're going to cover the fifth to the tenth aspirations. And numbers five through nine are the first path, because by the fifth aspiration, which is verse 22, we have unlabored renunciation and bodhicitta as our primary motivations in life. Now the commentaries on the Pranidhana Raja are not explicit about which verse refers to the attainment of the first path, but our aim is now clear. It doesn't mean we don't still experience difficulties on the path, which is why this week's aspirations start with the fifth aspiration, which is wearing the armor of dedication. There's no question in our minds that we wish to keep going on this journey. 
So now we're asking ourselves, how can we best deal with obstacles and ensure that we put in place the conditions for success? And since an important part of our bodhisattva aspiration and activity is engaging with other people, a significant focus of today's verses is about our aspiration in relating to others. Of course, we're going to continue to cultivate merit and wisdom on the first path so that our understanding and realization of emptiness continues to deepen and that we'll be able to progress on our bodhisattva journey and attain the second path. So by the 10th aspiration in verse 27, which is the last of this week's verses, we're on the second path. Again, the commentaries are not explicit about where the transition occurs, but here the verse talks about how we're aspiring to gather inexhaustible merit and wisdom, and so become an inexhaustible treasury of noble qualities. Although, of course, the verse notes that we're still wandering through all the states of samsaric existence. So we're on the second path. It's the highest stage as ordinary samsaric beings before we enter the third path, starting next week with the 11th of the 16 aspirations. Okay, so let's turn to the verses. Verse 22, which is the fifth aspiration, to wear the armor of dedication. I shall bring enlightened action to perfection, serve beings so as to suit their needs, teach them to accomplish good actions, and continue this throughout all the aeons to come. So Rinpoche explains this armor of bodhicitta in two different ways. First, he says it's about not feeling exhausted or losing inspiration, not becoming lethargic, not becoming discouraged. He says the reason we get discouraged is because we're not well versed in the Mahayana. We don't have enough understanding of wisdom and method. There are many examples given in the commentaries. For example, one bodhisattva got so exhausted and discouraged because he felt the path was taking so long. And the Buddha gave him encouragement by saying the time is totally an illusion. Another story is of a mother whose only child she dreams is drowning in a river. And the mother doesn't think twice and immediately she'll jump into the river to save her child. But the Bodhisattva, one who is adorned with wisdom, also knows this is just a dream. Okay, the second way we're talking about the Amra Bodhicitta is returning to this topic of fulfilling the wishes of all sentient beings by making our action or conduct harmonious to the actions of sentient beings. So we already talked about the YouTube Bodhisattva last week. We aim to align our action and activities with other beings. And at the same time, we also need to engage in the good conduct of ensuring their happiness and their benefit. So as Rupesha said, when you're talking to someone else, you should understand their receptivity to what you're saying. And what you say should be something they can hear, understand and accept. As he said, Bodhisattvas really don't want to be some kind of thorny teacher, always correcting beings, saying things like, don't do this, don't do that. It's much more about them aspiring to be a friend rather than a corrector or an inspector. And one of the commentaries on the Pranidhana Raja by Kempo Tsutram Gyamso, he explained that this set of verses, um, 22 to 25, which is the fifth to the eighth aspirations, can also be understood in terms of how to behave towards people that we may regard as lesser, equal, or greater than ourselves in terms of merit and wisdom. So this fifth aspiration in verse 22 is about how to behave towards people we regard as less than ourselves in terms of wisdom and merit. For example, in less fortunate circumstances, newer and less experienced in study and practice and so forth. And here, it's key that we don't look down on them with contempt. We don't discourage them. We don't belittle them. Because if we do that, it defeats the purpose of our aspiration to benefit them. So we're careful to have good conduct and behave properly towards them, to encourage them, to inspire them, as in the example of the YouTube Bodhisattva. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the way we see them as being lesser than us is accurate or correct. And indeed, as we progress in our cultivation of pure perception, we'll realize that seeing anyone as lesser or impure 
is itself a form of ignorance. So let's talk a little bit about this first idea of wearing the armor of bodhicitta in terms of handling the challenges that come up on the path. So we'll talk more about cultivating merit and wisdom to realize the view of emptiness starting next week. But given this th week's theme of perseverance in handling challenges, let's look at how we might face and handle challenges, setbacks, and disappointments. And here I'm going to use the same four stages we discussed in week three. Okay, so if those are the four stages of our practice, how might we approach the challenges and difficulties on the path, including difficulties with other people, as we progress? So using the same four stages.
life. So across these stages, our view transforms from seeing challenges as personal adversities to seeing them as opportunities for enlightenment, reflecting the profound transformation of our relationship with the world and with other people. And this shift underscores the essence of the Mahayana path, where obstacles are not merely to be overcome, but are seen as integral to the cultivation of wisdom and compassion, the core qualities of the Bodhisattva. Okay, so turning to the second way in which we can wear the armour of bodhicitta, how should we cultivate relationships on the Mahayana path? How can we be a good Kalyanamitra, or spiritual friend? Now, this is another very rich topic which goes to the heart of the meaning of Sangha in Buddhism. Now, we can't cover this in depth right now, but to dip a toe in the water, I'd like to talk about giving people both what they want and what they need. Just building on the example of the YouTube Bodhisattva. So this distinction touches on a complex aspect of human nature and also the path to enlightenment. Because our wants are often immediate, superficial desires, driven by attachment, ignorance or craving, reflecting our conditioned responses to the world. Whereas our needs, particularly in a spiritual context, refer to what would genuinely benefit us in the long term, leading to true happiness, liberation from suffering, and ultimately enlightenment. So addressing this distinction involves navigating several trade-offs and conflicts. So firstly, immediate gratification versus long-term benefit. We often want things that offer immediate gratification or relief from discomfort, but these desires may not align with what is beneficial for us in the long run. For example, we might want to spend our days in leisure and avoid difficult tasks, but what we might need might be to engage in practices that challenge us and lead to our growth. Secondly, material comfort versus spiritual development. A common want is for material comfort and security, which, while not inherently negative, can become a distraction from spiritual practice if pursued excessively. The need from a Buddhist viewpoint might be to cultivate detachment and contentment, focusing on our spiritual growth rather than accumulating material wealth. Third, affirmation of ego versus realization of non-self. We often seek affirmation of our ego through recognition, success, or popularity However, what we need, according to Buddhism, is to understand the concept of non-self, or anatta, and to realize that attachment to ego is a source of suffering. Fourth, following comfortable beliefs versus challenging our illusions. We might want to cling to certain beliefs or views that make us feel comfortable or secure, but what we need is to challenge our illusions and understand the true nature of reality as is taught in Dharma. So much like the YouTube Bodhisattva, we will encounter these tensions, both in our own practice and when we are aspiring to benefit others. So when might something that we want not be what we need? Well, firstly, when it perpetuates attachment and ignorance. If a want reinforces our attachment to the sensory world, or deepens our ignorance of the true nature of reality, it's likely not what's genuinely needed for our spiritual advancement. Secondly, when it leads away from compassion, desires that make us more self-centered or indifferent to the suffering of others are contrary to the development of compassion, which is a key aspect of what we need on the path to enlightenment. Third, when it distracts from mindfulness and presence, Wants that lead us towards mindless consumption or distraction, such as excessive entertainment, can pull us away from mindfulness and presence, which are essential for understanding Dharma. And fourth, when it conflicts with ethical conduct, desires that lead to actions conflicting with ethical conduct are not in line with what we need for spiritual progress. So addressing these trade-offs requires prajna or wisdom to see beyond our immediate desires to the deeper needs that lead to lasting happiness and liberation. 
As practitioners or as bodhisattvas seeking to guide and benefit others, we need to skillfully navigate these waters, sometimes meeting people where they are to gradually guide them towards realizing and embracing what they truly need. And this also involves compassionate and patient teaching, modeling behaviors, and sometimes making hard choices that may not be immediately understood or appreciated by those we aim to help. And it can be even more challenging to make wise trade-offs that will benefit others if our own renunciation is not yet heartfelt and genuine. Okay, so the sixth aspiration, which is verse 23. This is the aspiration to accompany other bodhisattvas. May I always meet and be accompanied by those whose actions accord with mine, and in body, speech, and mind as well, may our actions and aspirations always be one. So this verse is basically saying, may I encounter others who act and think in the same way that I'm aspiring to do. As Rinpoche said, this is very important, especially for beginner bodhisattvas, to have this kind of support and companionship, others who are also on the path with us. This can really help us in actualizing bodhicitta, but also in practicing good conduct. And this verse is about behaving towards people who we see as peers, those who are equals on the path. And with people who are our equals, we should not be competitive, but instead speak kindly of them, rejoice with them. The seventh aspiration, verse 24, is the aspiration to have virtuous teachers and to please them. May I always meet spiritual friends who long to be of true help to me and who teach me the good actions. Never will I disappoint them. And here Rinpoche said, the aspiration is to encounter a virtuous Mahayana teacher and not to displease or disappoint them. So this doesn't just apply to a Vajrayana guru or tantric teacher, as is revered in the Tibetan tradition, but also the virtuous spiritual teacher in the Mahayana path. Now he said that the word master perhaps isn't the right word in Buddhism. He said it's a very human language, maybe a good word for something like Kung Fu. But he said in Buddhism, a more appropriate word is the Sanskrit word Kalyanamitra, which means a spiritual friend or a virtuous friend, or even a fortunate or lucky friend. Our so-called guru or master should always be a virtuous friend. And here we're aspiring to encounter this virtuous friend at all times, in all kinds of occasions. For instance, at the moment we might feel like misbehaving, may he or she sort of turn up from a corner. Of course, it's kind of annoying, but that's our virtuous friend's job to save us from getting into trouble. So may we never dishearten them. As Rinpoche said, this last line is so beautiful. It means something like, may I never break their heart. And let's never forget that meeting a teacher is already a sign of merit, of our past aspiration bearing fruit. So it would be appropriate for us to adopt an appreciative mindset, to rejoice, praise, make offerings and show courtesy and respect. As we saw before, part of what makes our human birth precious is that we have someone who is teaching us the Dharma. And we should always assume there are qualities in others that we do not yet know about or understand, that are far better than we might have achieved ourselves. So we should always act with modesty. And this aspiration to meet spiritual friends always and at all times is like a first step on the journey to pure perception. In other words, seeing the Buddha everywhere. When we aspire, may I always meet spiritual friends, we're aspiring, may all circumstances become a Dharma teaching. For someone who really understands the view of emptiness, they can see anything as a Dharma teaching. Anything can inspire them to see the truth. And I don't mean the ordinary sense of being inspired by a beautiful tree or a vast landscape or a beautiful sunset or even amazing art or music. Yes, those things touch us emotionally, 
But that doesn't mean they inspire us to have greater insight into non-duality. It doesn't mean they inspire us to see the Dharma, to see the truth. Whereas, as Rinpoche said, if you have enough merit and wisdom, even just the sight of a falling leaf can bring about the awareness of impermanence and lead to spontaneous renunciation. In the Nyingma tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, there's a famous story of how the great master Patro Rinpoche introduced the nature of mind to Nisha Longtuk outside Dzogchen Monastery in Tibet. He said the very famous lines, do you see the stars up in the sky? And they were lying beside each other on the ground. And in that moment, Nisha Longtuk got it. He was introduced to the nature of mind. And yet, as Rinpoche said, how many times have young lovers said those same words to each other? Do you see the stars, my love? And yet those same words only become a source of greater attachment and delusion. So this is what it means to have the merit to be able to see all circumstances as a teaching. It's the difference between Nisha Longtuk being able to understand, do you see the stars and accomplish insight into emptiness? And the young couple hearing the same words, and for them, it just leads them to more attachment and delusion. So the key is learning to see all circumstances in a way that truly benefits us. And of course, this is also practical worldly advice. Can we bring a mindset of openness and learning when we face challenges and difficulties, rather than being closed, defensive and emotionally reactive? So the eighth aspiration, verse 25, is the aspiration to see the Buddhas and serve them in person. May I always behold the Buddhas here before my eyes and around them all their Bodhisattva sons and daughters without ever tiring throughout all the aeons to come. May the offerings I make them be endless and vast. So as Rupesha said, you know, he wasn't really clear how to articulate this, because what we're talking about here is seeing millions of bodhisattvas and Buddhas right now as we open our eyes, not in the future. As he said, you just need to learn to see them, not just to look, but to actually see them. And not only see them, but interact with them, make offerings, ask questions, receive answers. And this is something we can do right now. Shurushi said, Vajrayana people love this because the Vajrayana always says, if you want to see the Buddha, you really have to have the Guru's blessing. And likewise, here this verse is saying, if you really want to see these ocean-like Buddhas, you don't want to break the heart of your virtuous friend. So with these last few verses, we see how to relate to others. So verse 22, for those we see as lesser than us, we take care not to disrespect them. Verse 23, for those we see as peers, we don't compete. Verse 24, those we see as teachers or mitras, we don't disappoint. And in verse 25, this verse, for the Buddhas, we wish to always see them and never tire, to become fully integrated. So as Rupesha said, you know, let's not forget this is part of the Avatamsaka Sutra flower ornament sutra and he said I don't know the definition of ornament in English but it's something like arranging things so that suddenly everything is accentuated and becomes kind of special so he held up a flower and he said for instance take this flower in our limited human mind we might say it's an ornament and subconsciously or maybe consciously the fact that this flower is here could make everything all the other parts of this room beautiful, more bearable. Rinpoche said the idea of the Avatamsaka Sutra is you just need to learn how to add that jewel to your life. For example, if you're putting on jewelry like an earring, you might add a blue sapphire or a pearl and then everything works out. Now the ear is also nice. Next to the ear, the nose suddenly looks good. Next to the nose, the mouth suddenly looks good. And then everything looks good. So again, this is 
non-ordinary seeing. Rupesha talked about this a lot, even in the most basic teachings of Vipassana, where the Sanskrit word vi means special or extra or greater. Rupesha said it's about seeing the real deal or the true color. And now in the Avatamsaka Sutra, we have the beginning of this idea of sacred or pure perception, where we see everything as already enlightened, filled with Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, which we further extend with the idea of pure perception in the Vajrayana. But of course, there's also this element of deliberately making things beautiful, right? ornamenting them. So for example, in our practice of offering and praise, in our form practice, back to the idea that we saw before, it's already pure, and also may I make it pure, right? that twofold aspiration we talked about last week, Similarly here we have, it's already beautiful, but may I make it beautiful? So we'll continue to explore this idea of pure perception in the coming weeks. Okay, the ninth aspiration, verse 26, is the aspiration to keep the Dharma thriving. May I maintain the sacred teachings of the Buddhas and cause enlightened action to appear. May I train to perfection in good actions and practice these in every age to come. So here we're aspiring to hold the Dharma or the speech of the Buddhas, not just for a short duration, but for countless aeons. And I'm also aspiring that may I be able to fully illuminate, express, teach the Dharma to others. So the conduct of Bodhisattva Samantabhadra, noble in every aspect, arises in the mind stream of myself and others. In other words, I'm aspiring to manifest as a teacher. So the progression goes from seeing others who are lesser, seeing others as peers, seeing others as teachers, seeing the Buddhas everywhere. And now in this verse, my inner teacher, my Buddha nature is beginning to manifest. And even more so then, on the last of this week's verses, verse 27, this is the tenth aspiration to acquire inexhaustible treasure. As I wander through all the states of samsaric existence, may I gather inexhaustible merit and wisdom, and so become an inexhaustible treasury of noble qualities, of skill and discernment, samadhi and liberation. So we're aspiring now to have an inexhaustible treasury of merit and wisdom. So even when we are going through hardships in benefiting others, we always have this inexhaustible treasury to draw upon. And we're also encouraging ourselves by beginning to acknowledge we already possess the innate Buddha nature and innate Buddha qualities. So that when we encounter difficulties or people who belittle us, we can give ourselves more credit and rely upon our own goodness. Now, as this verse says, we're still wandering in samsara, right? So we're not yet on the third path or the first bhumi. But nevertheless, we have acquired inexhaustible merit and wisdom. So we are on the second path, right? The highest stage before the path of seeing. And as with all of the verses, we continue to emphasize gathering merit and wisdom, because these are the causes of our further progress on the path. And we're increasingly becoming self-sufficient here on our path and in our practice, Re less reliant on outer circumstances, more able to fully embody the Buddha's teaching that you are your own master. So, building on the previous verse where we were a holder of the Dharma, we are now really manifesting more of our innate Buddha qualities, this inexhaustible treasury of noble qualities, the final stage before we attain the path of seeing. I, I wanted to touch on one question from the 2016 teachings on the Pranidhana Raja in Taiwan where someone asked Rupshe, how can we be sincere in our aspirations? They said, I feel when I say aspiration prayers, it's never really sincere. And even if I think or feel I am sincere, 
I still think in reality that it's not sincere. So please, can you give us your thoughts about sincerity? And Rupeshe said in answer, this is quite an important question. The issue of sincerity, whether or not we're sincere, comes from whether or not we have the full picture, so to speak. And this is difficult. He said, first, I'll tell you something practical, because even myself, many times, I don't feel sincere, but I aspire that if I keep on repeating my aspiration, if I keep on faking it, then maybe sometimes, once in a blue moon, it will be sincere. And then hopefully, this sincere state will slowly take over. Now, of course, this is true of all practice. If it was already perfect, it wouldn't be practice. So we've already talked about the benefits of taking refuge and making the aspiration of bodhicitta over and over again. Yeah, ideally, a hundred thousand times in our Nundra practice, for example. Rinpoche said the real issue with sincerity is that we see things in the context of past, present and future. We always separate these three. The past is gone, it's never going to come back. The future is a wild guess. Well, you can have an educated guess, but we're never really certain. And the present, well, most of the time, even the present is controlled by causes and conditions. So this separation or alienation of the three times is the real cause of our insincerity. And he talked about how in the sutras, there is an expression about having a gooseberry on your palm. So this refers to the Indian gooseberry, or the Mirobalan, which in Tibetan is called the Kyurura. And supposedly when the Ahats and sublime beings look at the world, that's how they see it. The Kyurura is mentioned in verse 224 of chapter six, which is one of the closing lines of the famous chapter six on wisdom in Chandrakirti's Madhyamakavatara, entering the middle way. And here the sixth Bhumi Bodhisattva's wisdom is said to be as clear as a Mirobalan fruit or a Kyurura held in his own hand. And this is because the Kyurura fruit is supposedly transparent and the lines of one's hand are visible through the fruit. So this is actually a wonderful analogy for self-transcendence, a right? realization of anatta. Or we could say being in the world, but not of the world. Because you can see the fruit, but you can also see through the fruit. It's a bit like looking at the window and you can see the glass of the window, but you can also see through the window and see the view beyond at the same time. So the relative truth, right, the self, the window glass, the gooseberry, doesn't go away but the foreground and background shift, and now you can see the ultimate truth, the emptiness or view through the window or behind the gooseberry, you see the hand. And as our practice deepens, gradually we go beyond focusing on either just the foreground or just the background, and we learn to see both relative and ultimate truth simultaneously as we progress towards non-duality. Zerushi so said likewise, for the Ahats and sublime beings, there is far less separation of past, present and future. For them, past is now, future is now, now is now. And therefore there's much less guessing. And he said, of course, we really have to reach that sort of level to really generate sincerity. And for us, we're still bound by time and space. So there's a lot of guessing. And whenever there's guessing, it's understandable that sincerity is difficult. So we really need to hear more and contemplate upon the grand view, which we'll come to next week in week six, because most of the reasons that we're not sincere are because our view is very limited. And we don't yet have the bird's eye view of emptiness. So we'll come to this grand view next week, but I'd like to close this week by bringing us back to basics and talking a little bit about the concept of beginner's mind, or Shoshin in Japanese, which comes from the tradition of Chan or Zen Buddhism, but it's also valuable across the broader spectrum of Buddhist practice, including for us on the Bodhisattva path. This is an attitude of openness, eagerness, and lack of preconceptions when we approach the world, 
when we approach other people, or even our practice, even at the most advanced level. And this mindset is particularly valuable for maintaining freshness and encouraging perseverance on the Bodhisattva path for several reasons. Firstly, an openness to learning. The Bodhisattva path is infinite. There are countless beings to help and endless lessons to be learned. Having a beginner's mind keeps us open to new teachings and perspectives, which is essential for continuous growth that's required on this path. We take the view that anyone or anything can be a source of learning and new insight. Secondly, we maintain flexibility in our approach. With a beginner's mind, we remain flexible and adaptable, able to respond to the needs of others in the most effective way possible. We don't get stuck in our personal preferences or habits. And this flexibility is crucial for a bodhisattva who seeks to benefit all beings in whatever ways are most skillful. Third, it helps prevent spiritual pride. The bodhisattva path can be long and challenging. And achieving milestones or progress can lead to spiritual pride. Whereas maintaining a beginner's mind helps us stay humble, reminding us there's always more to learn and further to grow, thus helping us to keep our ego in check. Fourth, it helps us revitalize our practice. The beginner's mind imbues our practice with a sense of wonder and curiosity, preventing it from becoming routine or mechanical even our aspiration practice itself. So it keeps our practice fresh and meaningful, even after many repetitions or long periods of training. There's a famous Zen saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And in the same way, with a beginner's mind, we learn how to make all of our practice and all of our activities fresh and vital. Finally, it helps us cultivate compassion through relatability. With a beginner's mind, we remember what it was like to be a beginner ourselves. And so it enables us to better help and relate to those just starting out on their path, fostering empathy and allowing us to be better as spiritual friends and companions. So how might we do this? Well, first through mindfulness practice, engaging in mindfulness meditation at whatever level we practice it, helps us to cultivate awareness of the present moment, helps us cultivate an attitude of openness and curiosity about our moment to moment experience, which is essential for the beginner's mind. Second, we can embrace learning as a continuous process. We can actively remind ourselves that learning should never stop. We can approach teachings and experiences with the idea that there's always something new or different to understand, even in what seems familiar. We can challenge our preconceptions. We can challenge our own ideas and beliefs about the practice and the path. Maybe we might study new texts, have Dharma discussions with friends and companions on the path, or just question our own interpretation and understanding. Fourth, we can cultivate curiosity. We can make a conscious effort to cultivate curiosity in our daily lives and in our practice. We can cultivate the practice of asking questions, exploring different perspectives, including the perspectives of other people that might be very different from us. And we can seek out new experiences, both in our lives and in the framework of our practice. Fifth, we can practice humility. We can recognize and accept our limitations and the vastness of what we don't know. This humility is a cornerstone of the beginner's mind. It keeps us open to learning and growth. And finally, we can always come back to basics and reflect on the fundamentals. We can regularly return to the fundamental teachings and practices of Buddhism, approaching them as if for the first time. We can seek to rediscover their depth and nuance which might otherwise be overlooked with familiarity. And we might find that indeed, we can never step in the same river twice, and that seemingly basic or familiar teachings can reveal themselves to us in a completely new way. So in summary, 
By valuing and cultivating a beginner's mind, we can cultivate the humility, openness and flexibility necessary to grow in our practice and effectively work for the benefit of all beings. This mindset's a powerful antidote to complacency, spiritual pride and the stagnation of our practice, ensuring that our path remains living, vibrant and an inspiring journey. So with that, let's take a moment to dedicate our merit. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you.